Welcome to Base Space. A crypto podcast. Base Space. Yeah, yeah. we def- we definitely uh, w- want to dive deep into trueflation, uh, but I just want to welcome everyone that's that's tuning into the base space real quick. Uh, for everyone that doesn't know, this is a crypto podcast hosted by myself, Crypto Mewtwo, Chase Coins, and Super High that creates opportunities for growth, networking, and education in the crypto industry. And I love to welcome our guest, Stefan Rust, founder and CEO of True Fate, Trueflation. Welcome to the show, Stefan. Hey, thank you. Nice to be here, and 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 thank you, every, you know, for for having me and and taking time out and and listening in. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad we're able to connect. Um, yeah. For all the new guests that we bring on the show, we always like to ask ask them how they got into crypto. <laughs> yeah, no, I was um, I got into crypto 2012. I bought my first Bitcoin um, using eBay. Uh, and and buying them with PayPal and using a Bitcoin J wallet. I was working with developers around the world. So I had a, I set up a developer agency. So we had a network of software developers largely focused around mobile apps. And we were working with, with, um, with Google, with Intel, with Qualcomm, Sony, all the big tech companies, um, Juniper Networks. And we were building and maintaining their developer relationships and then being a prime contractor for some and then subcontracting some of the work to these developers while at the same time organizing hackathons around the world. Um, And we were doing about 30 a year in any given city on the planet. And so throughout that, one of the developers in Latin America asked me to pay them in Bitcoin. Do I, would I pay, consider paying them in Bitcoin? And so 2012, got into it, bought some, didn't think much about it until maybe six months later. Um, then all of a sudden, I realized the price had gone from $5. I think it jumped up to about $200. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I got to do more about this. And then at the same time, I then said, look, oh, to that same developer, I said, look, I'll pay you in crypto. Let's do it. And so on Skype, in those days, we were all using Skype. I then we had got onto video. I then he gave me his address. I sent it to him from my Bitcoin J wallet live. It was instantaneous and there were no fees. And in contrast, in those days, you had the banks that would do that for you. They would use this swift system. It would take you seven days to get verified and confirmed. And then it would cost you about, you know, a couple hundred dollars for any kind of transaction. And so from that moment on, I was sold. Right. And so really, I really got into it in 2013. We organized events and et cetera. And so that's how I got into crypto or Bitcoin. That's amazing, man. And I know you once led uh, Bitcoin.com. How did, how did that come about as well? Yeah, so I met Roger at a conference in, yeah, actually a financial conference. And we just got to chatting and I was introduced to him. We then just kept on, you know, there was a whole bunch of stream of people there and and we shared a lot of the same philosophies, Um, you know, the sort of core values associated with crypto, you know, the whole sort of permissionless, immutable, you know, censorship resistant, et cetera, et cetera. How do we continue to drive that? And we saw eye to eye. He then asked me to sort of help out with corporate development. And, and I said, yeah, he's got, you know, ultimately a lot of his fingers are in a lot of different pies and he's engaged in a lot of different activities as well as growing the Bitcoin cash community. And so what I loved about Bitcoin cash at the time was it was or still do is the pre-consensus model that they deploy, which allows for zero conf transaction which means instantaneous transfer of funds without, with, by mitigating double spend at the same time. And so beautiful you know, interaction for a retail payments, peer-to-peer payment experience. And, and then he asked me to be the CEO and, and run. And so came on as CEO, revamped uh, the branding, brought on a new wallet team, 
launched a new wallet that now has 25 wallet, 25 million users uh, wallets out there uh, on the mobile phone. It's now gone into not only Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin, but now supports Ethereum. Um, and so trying to build a fintech entity uh, for Bitcoin.com. But then COVID hit and, and, and everything sort of changed. And that's where, yeah, that we decided to just, you know, yeah, just I wanted to do other things beyond just uh, money. And, and, and we just decided to part ways. And yeah, we're still on really good terms. So yeah, love to see what they continue to do. But I'm super excited about what I'm doing now, which is Truflation and got an awesome team. That's really good fun. Yeah, it's incredible that you've been, you know, part of the space for so long. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just kind of tell us a little bit also around like how you came around, like founding Truflation and what kind of uh, inspired you to, to build the company. Yeah, when COVID hit, I mean, I just felt that the, you know, we've, I've, we've always felt that there is something not quite right between how, you know, the separation of state and money, right? So we had the separation of state and religion, and that resulted in, in, in you know, a, a huge, you know, gross phase throughout the world and, and information being spread out and made available to everybody, Um and as a result, how do we do the same with state and money? And that was sort of bringing crypto around. Then I saw that with smart contracts and, and ultimately, you know, how can we separate governance from state as well or minimize the amount of governance that is going through centralized entities and decentralize those? Um, and then I'd been struggling to sort of find where the right entry point was um, started off with sort of some of the climate stuff and looked at that area, carbon credits, got really excited about the ability to tokenize carbon credits and put that in, you know, consumers' hands and investors' hands that wanted to then allocate funds towards protecting humanity on the planet and the environment that we live in. So we don't need to walk around with masks and hazmat suits, but we can actually walk around in jeans and T-shirts and look at each other's faces. Um but I actually then realized that the governments were just printing so much money and saying, oh, it's transitory, right? And it's like, come on, this can't, this, this can't go about. The only reason we do not have inflation on this planet is because of technology. Technology has allowed us to bring down the cost of most of what we do in life to offset the rising prices for maybe gas, rent, and foods. And so looking at that in more detail, I said, wow, you know, and, and looking at the sort of crypto landscape, in crypto land, everybody's talking about inflation. It's such a hot topic, but nobody was attacking, tackling it. Um, and so we thought, ooh, why don't we do something in that area? How do we take it on? And so, yeah, that's sort of how it came about. We can do this. And we then found out that inflation data is run by the BLS. It's built on 1920s infrastructure. So a decade, a century ago, right? So the infrastructure and the concept was built out in an age where it was all still paper-based. Um, it was still, you know, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have real time. So how do we take a developer approach to building out something for you know the the this century right or the future and and that's sort of how it came about and and um yeah working with with the team we found some data scientists to help us break down inflation it turns out a lot of people have been working internally on trying to replicate or do inflation data particularly in the financial services industry um, but they've just kept it to themselves, right? So kept it very proprietary on their own for their own calculations of, of bond, the bond market. Uh, what, what is inflation? How is it going to impact yield curves? How is it going to impact the gold reserves that are sitting or used to sit at, at a lot of the treasuries in, in governments, etc.? So 
yeah, we just felt, okay, how do we open source it? How do we provide more insights? How do we create a transparency associated with it? And how do we put it under a DAO structure and, and tokenize it? And, and that's sort of where we got it to today. Our key was to get it out, get something out fast, which we launched in December 1. We launched Truflation. And then in, yeah, and, and now we're optimizing it. We've got a dashboard coming up. Um, I think in the imminent uh, future, we're revamping the website. We're now trying to identify new data sources, more data sources for the appropriate buckets, and now finding consumers of the feeds that we're going to be providing now that it's on Chainlink. That's awesome. I, I think it's yeah. extremely noble cause to you know provide like an open source um, data data feed for inflation that anyone can tap into and that any any DAP can really utilize. Um, I realize you've only been live, uh, you know, for a few months. Uh, but throughout this process of of building Truflation, what has kind of been like the most important lesson that you've learned so far? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the most I think. Good question. Really, I, I've never really had time to reflect on what what it was. But um, in summary, going back and, and looking, I think getting something out quickly and tweaking it was really valuable. I think it's really, and then having the community come back to you and provide input in how you can optimize it, how you can improve it, where to find customers, what other data sources. That has been really helpful. And I think um, you can also find, you know, one thing is, I don't know, you know, I mean, if you give yourself 30 days to launch something, you know, I think Elon Musk says it. If you give yourself 30 days to clean your room, you'll take 30 days. If you do give yourself three hours, you'll clean your room in three hours. And I think we took the three hour philosophy. How do we get it out there? How do we get feedback? And then how do we find areas to structure it a bit better? and optimize it. And, and I think we're now at the point where how do we put in quality control issues? Um, how do we, uh, yeah, exactly. So now how are we optimizing our data sets? How do we get better data sets? How do we get more data sets? How do we get to better, you know, consensus models for truth, right? Um, and, 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 I don't think, in, you know, and, and what we've all also heard is the feedback from the industry around timing, right? So the cost for the industry seems to be pretty big if it's on a monthly basis. Can we do it on a weekly basis? Yeah, we could do. But I think the industry would find that far better uh, and, uh, and appreciates that more than on a monthly basis. Could we do it on a daily basis? They would appreciate that equally as much on a minute by minute basis or real time, it, the industry is not ready yet for that. And I don't think inflation data or prices change that much on a minute by minute basis. So that feedback was also super valuable uh, from the industry. And Stefan, <clears throat> yeah. I'm just you know curious, um, and I'm, I'm sure some people are, are curious as well in the audience, uh, why is bringing this real market inflation rate on chain a big deal for DeFi smart contracts? Yeah, to trust it. <laughs> mm -hmm. it simple, simple trust, right? I think, you know, like I said, the 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 the, the inflation data is managed by the BL, the the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, the BLS. It's built on 1920s um, sort of um, processes and models. Ultimately. The data set itself, I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty mature. It's, I mean, you can't really criticize it because it's gone through so many iterations and you've had so many brainiacs work on it um, and, and tweak it and optimize it that I think it's pretty mature. But ultimately, we don't know because of, one, it's, it's census built. So that means that they go out, they have a poll of users, they pull those users or that data set that pulls it in together and then oh, they extrapolate from the polling that they've done as it how what how does it impact the whole nation right number one so that's a bit of an older model how can we improve on that um but the actual calculation itself you could argue is pretty accurate um we just felt that we can use you know rather than polling 
um, we can actually go real time and aggregate real time data, right? So for real estate, for example, you, I mean, do you need to go and, and, and poll, you know, a number of institutions that are renting it out and shopping malls and, and finding out what the price is? Or can you go to Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com, you know, Airbnb, uh, and all these, you know, and, and, and aggregate from an API perspective that data and then have a, a number of sources of data, cross verify them and say, boom, this is what it is, right? And this is what the latest purchase was. And I don't need to wait a month and another 10 days to be able to calculate what inflation was 10 days and a month ago. And, and that was sort of um, where we, we decided to go and, and, and why we decided to change it. So kind of like expanding on Super's question there with the smart contracts and bringing this data on chain, like what are, yep. what are some like tangible use cases for somebody who may not be kind of really kind of dialed in on economics? Like what are some tangible use cases that, um, how is this like revolutionizing the game essentially? And like, what will this kind of bring to people utilizing it in smart contracts? Um, I, 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 there are a number of, of, of use cases, right? I mean, um, um, one is a simple one is pricing. If you price your product, a lot of what you do is you have a, de a product development cycle that if you're doing a physical a chair, for example, the price of wood, I want to be able to price that once it's gone through the product line, I want to be able to price it as it goes to market. What is the out forecast and what is inflation for wood? And then how do I bake that into my price so that when I charge it out, I'm still being covered for my cost of goods. And so that's a super simple case. Um, and then you can, ex yeah, and that, that's one example. Um, yeah. And then obviously in the financial services industry, that's where it becomes a lot more, uh, eco you know, so um, yeah. And in crypto land, for example, a stable coin, right? You launch a stable coin, um, and I want to protect with that stable coin. The ultimate goal is how do I protect your purchasing power um, as you use that stable coin? So I want inflation data to protect that. If I have to wait a month to give you an update, that might mean in inflation is 11 percent. That means at the end of the month, I have to mint a whole set of, of new tokens to ensure that I'm protecting your purchasing power. Whereas if I can do it on a daily basis or a weekly basis, I'm breaking down that minting cost back to, you know, um, yeah, across a month, right? Or, or to do a daily basis, a weekly basis, whatever you prefer. So the cost of minting new tokens and issuing new tokens has a far uh, less of a dilution effect than I, if I do it on a daily basis. So those are a couple of examples. Gotcha. Yeah. And almost, like the way um, I'm interpreting it is it kind of enables the markets to be more efficient in a more transparent way as well. Yeah. It's like not so much like kind of shocks to the end jolts, kind of like to the system, because it's kind of really getting arbed out in real time as that data starts coming in. Exactly. No, no, totally. And I think that's that's the um, interesting element. Right. So it's like it just it just provides it increases fluidity in the ecosystem and in the economy. And if we have more liquidity in the economy, then that means more trade happens, money flows faster, more people um, are doing trades, right? Um, and, and, and so that, that, that is sort of one of the reasons we wanted behind it. And ultimately trust, how can we make sure that you know we can trust and have full transparency into the calculation itself what are the sources of data how do we um, communicate the data elements how do we provide a dashboard so other than at the moment you know if you go to our site you have to read the white paper and troll through everything but in a couple of weeks time you'll have a dashboard where you can actually see all the elements and you'll be able to play around with them and, and, and see what the impact is. Um, and then ultimately, you can just pull it off a, you know, you know, but with a Git request off, you know, off the chain link repo. 
Yeah, you, you kind of hinted towards this earlier where I think you had touched on the framework of how they measure um, inflation and it's really kind of dated. But I was curious, could you could you expand on the methodologies that you guys use uh, at Trueflation and specifically um, can you kind of expand on how has the measuring of CPI changed over the decades officially? <laughs> yeah, it's changed quite a bit. I think in 1970, there was a big change in the calculation. And that was around um, when the gold reserve when it was, was, you know, the, the need for having um, a gold reserve to back your currency was taken away. That changed the calculation of inflation. Then I think in the 80s, there was a financial crisis, and that also had an impact. Um, and if you would actually rebase inflation, so the 7% that was announced last Wednesday, and you would rebase that based on the model that they used back in the 70s, we would be having a far high, I don't know the number anymore, but we did the calculation in December when they announced inflation data. But that would you know, it would be up in the teens, so the high teens percentage, so much greater than the 7% that we have now. Um, and, and, and they've then sort of, they've changed the model from it actually being the cost of goods to the cost of a lifestyle. And that in some summarizes the real change. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> So, so it's no longer your steak is a hundred dollars. You have you can that same steak is now a hundred and ten dollars or something. It's now oh oh now we have Beyond Meat, so you can use that steak. You don't need to have the lifestyle is you like steaks, you like meat, but now we have Beyond Meat. You can eat Beyond Meat because that's a replacement and that's going to be at a cheaper cost than meat. So actually, it's not inflationary. So we can take that out or replace that with lifestyle. Um, and and there were certain replacements. I think so. I mean, it's it was, I think it was around. I can't remember what it was around, but it was around chicken. You know, there was something. Oh, you can replace that with chicken now, or something like that. So it was like, but you still get your proteins, right? So that was sort of the argument. And I think, in essence, it sort of came down: how can we protect your lifestyle? And that's what inflation is about: calculating versus the cost of the individual good itself. Gotcha. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this, like, this, is, uh, this is needed. Absolutely. Yeah. And kind of like building off that, and you had talked about, you know, the trust factor for you guys, where actually are you sourcing the data? So all sorts of, um, um, also, I mean, yeah, we, we're getting it from multiple different sources. We've partnered with key institutions that have actually aggregated that data so, you know, we're, we're sourcing some of the, let's say, real estate data, not only from some of the sources I've mentioned already, but also working with like Penn State University that actually have calculated and made visible a lot of information associated with real estate. The other thing is in, in the CPI, real estate is not included because they feel that that is an asset versus a cost. But ultimately, if you're renting, which most people coming into the workplace today start off with renting and rent does reflect a bigger portion of your monthly outgoings versus rent and food. Right. And then education and then, um, you know, sort of lifestyle sort of that's those are the sort of the big cost items. And so rent, we felt, was an important element to embed in there. And so we've included rent in there as an example. And we source it from multiple different sources. We go to the NASDAQ to get some of the futures and commodities prices. We go to, um, you know, some of the pricing indexes from Yahoo. We're going to big grocery store data aggregators, pulling it from them. Um, and, and, and how do we evolve that? How do we get more insights into um yeah sort of the transportation market right gas prices energy commodities and stuff like that that's where we go for that um medical care is another thing that's super important uh and and, and pretty costly how do we incorporate that education just things like that so we've bucketed we've created these buckets and then we're just going down at the moment we're using a lot of 
the same sources that the CPI do use, but we're looking to drive towards replacing that and having 80% of the data sources be from independent alternative uh, providers. Gotcha. And kind of going back, I'm just thinking about it because you made a really good point about how technology really is deflationary. And I'm thinking about this old model that we're still using, you know, um, at least the BLS is using. How, how do you think we incorporate the deflationary rate when it comes to kind of um, allocating, if you will, towards technology and how that's affecting inflation? I know it's probably an extremely difficult question, but is that something you've kind of thought about is um, how to balance out that that matrix and incorporating that that into the equation? Yeah, I mean, we've we've thought about it and we have debates on that. My and and I think that the problem you have with that is. Everybody's got an opinion associated with how you balance that. Right. And and. How do you get to a con- and so that's where we're trying to build a, a number one is a DAO to help structure that right so if you've really got a strong opinion you can stake your tokens and then you can voice a a recommendation towards the evolution of that algorithm if you will for lack of a better name um, but everybody's got an opinion if you get a hundred people in a room. You know, and they're all highly educated economists. Every you know, so it's like, how do we number one take into account all those opinions? Yet on the same token, how do we convert that and put that into simple layman's terms based on what I'm experiencing on the ground? You know, when I go to the gas station, right, and I'm seeing how do I correlate the two, right, and 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 that's. That's where I think we want to spend a lot of our time and our efforts in, in, in finding that balance. Um, and, and we haven't found it yet. I mean, it's an experimentation and we want to work with the community to to really help us get down that path and, and identify how to make that work. The, yeah. Yeah. So just the example I was thinking of, just obviously this would be, I would say, at least probably a decade from here um, in this theory. But you know, the software is eating the world, right? Yep. And with the rise of adoption of AR and VR, um, we've talked about it on the, on the show before about how your TV could no longer be a physical item and it could be software code that is integrated into your mm-hmm. AR glasses. So you could just have a TV that's actually really just software. So there's no longer that physical good um, that needs to be kind of transported around. Yeah, yeah. And then, and taking that above, like, you know, as more and more people spend time in the Medverse with the VR, you may not need to buy as many real world clothing items because you actually spend the majority of your time at home and you'd rather spend that on an NFT apparel item. And so I'm thinking about, OK, how what does that look like and what is the effect on measuring inflation? Yeah, that I mean, super valid question. And, you know, just to your point. You know, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I've been testing out a lot of, you know, the metaverse and, and, and the screens. I mean, there's this app immersed inside VR where I can have like, you know, as many different monitors as I want. And I can actually have my c- keyboard communicating with that. And so it's like, man, you know, it's like heaven. <laughs> um, but um, what we haven't actually, we've we've taken into account metaverse. We've looked at how we can bring an experience into metaverse um, and, and, and ultimately we see that as a long-term future where and how we haven't really thought through that. But I think to your point, one thing I'm super excited about is if I look at each of the chains that are out there and I look at the tokens on there and you're saying, let's say you have, a, a, you know, you, you stake your token anywhere and you're earning 20% APY or 100% APY, how, and the APY is in that specific token itself, how do we provide you an inflation adjusted APY? And the inflation is to that blockchain itself. Um, And to me, I'd love to get to a point where 
we're helping with trueflation inside crypto land to the respective crypto chains, right? And, and, and how do we do that? I think that's the sort of next challenge that I'd really love to spend some cycles on as well. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point, especially um, with the recent DeFi 2.0 emergence and you saw yeah. home and time, you see these kind of yeah. insane APYs and, you know, you're kind of thinking, oh, like I'm, I'm making all this money, but, you know, there, there is kind of the, it's a double-edged sword because there's also it's the supplies inflating as well. So having that kind of honest metric to kind of really give you a um, a clear signal, I, I could see that being extremely valuable. And I think that's actually a really good segue to my next question I was going to ask you is, um, and you had kind of touched on this already with your partnership with Chainlink, but what, what does that partnership look like? And um, could you kind of touch on the process of that you guys went through to become a data provider? Yeah. So, um, how did that process start? I think, um, yeah, we were introduced, you know, um, to Chainlink pretty early on in the process. And one of, one of our biz dev teams had a really close relationship with, uh, Chainlink introduced us. We got the conversation going and I think we hit it off right away. I mean, it was like, we had the same philosophy. We shared the same vision. Um, and, you know, they were looking for something in this space anyway, as was. And at the same time, you also had the sort of dash inflation dashboard competition that was out there that Chainlink is also helping uh, sponsor. And, and, and so the timing was really good. Um, and obviously, the, yeah, I mean, the source of truth in crypto land are these oracles. So how do we get onto these oracles? And We'd obviously always been looking at the multiple oracles out there. Chainlink, obviously the biggest one, you know, having 80% or 90% market share. So Link seemed the right partner. So what does it take to get on there? They pointed us in the right direction. We created, we set up a node. So we're now a node operator. Uh, we, we set up an adapter first. Oh no, you can get onto the market where we can actually have an immediate Git request. So we don't need to plug in and adapt. So nobody needs to plug in the adapter. Um, and so that went just on and on. And we were just getting more and more into Chainlink and seeing all the opportunities that they have. And then ultimately getting to a point where we're now really considering to be, you know, or we are going down the path of becoming a Dawn, right? A data Oracle network on Chainlink. Uh, what does that look like? What are the structures for that? And yeah, and they've been super accommodating. I mean, the documentation's really good. Uh, the team members are super open, uh, uh, you know, approachable, you know, not only online in chat groups, also in video calls, um, and they move fast, right? And in crypto, I think moving fast and execution are the two critical things that I, you know, we push with our teams and everybody on our team, you know, loves to work fast and get that gratification of accomplishment quick and soon. And and Chainlink seems to have that same mentality and mindset. And so, yeah, you know, it's 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 a mind meld, as you'd say. Uh, and 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 that's been fun. That's awesome. I, I love yeah. that. And yeah, a lot a lot of us here are really big uh, Link Marines uh, or Chainlink fans. So can you, uh, can you tell me how did the link Marine name come about? I, I no nobody's ever really been able to tell me where Marine, the word Marine, why link Marine? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a story before my time. Um, okay. so I, I don't know if I'm the appropriate person to kind of, uh, share that story because it, that, that happened years before I really kind of came along, but, um, it, it's a, yeah. it's a strong community. So the name fits, yeah. right? Because uh, you have the XRP maybe, maybe we have Marines, an answer. But you have the oh, Marines. Right? Oh. <laughs> I think Mike knows. Mike from Chainlink's here. Let's uh, see what let's see what the answer has. Oh, What's Mike? What's up, Mike? What's up, guys? Yeah. Hey, Stefan. Uh, just wanted to say because hey, uh, Marines are badass. <laughs> uh, okay. Nice. Nice. And we hope for the trenches. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And I, I definitely, I love it, right? Because, yeah, I, I feel they are, I mean, I, I don't want to say they're badass, but they are definitely in the trenches. They roll up their sleeves and, and, and you know, they plow through it, if you will, if that's, you know, that's sort of the motto. And, and yeah, I, I also like the approach of let's get it to market and we'll tweak it, optimize it and make it really good and improve the yeah so improve as we go along so that meant that, yeah really like that yeah uh last question i had uh, around this topic um I, I i think it's really interesting what you guys are doing because it's it really is kind of that new innovative like pushing the boundary and really kind of pushing what is being developed within this industry um so are, are you any are you aware of any protocols that are utilizing uh your services yet? I don't think yet. Um, I I know of three or four services that are, are looking at it and working with it. Uh, one is a prediction market. The other one is a stable coin. Um, and the other one are yield calculators. And so, hence, I brought up those three examples. Uh, one is a prediction market where you can then you know, sort of bet, if you will, or try to predict the inflation and where it's going. You can predict the comparison between CPI and trueflation. Um, the other one is you can, um, yeah, uh, that's on the prediction markets. I mean, the stable coin, I talked about that example earlier on. And then the other one was around, um, uh, yeah, the yield, the yield comparison. How do I trueflation adjust the yield? Um, and and that's the third party that's that's looking to consume the feed. Um, that's about what I know. But I mean, who else knows? I think the community and and developers will have a far greater imagination than I will have around what to be able to do with this trueflation as. As we go down this path, the more and more people we talk to, the more and more ideas come back, and the more and more companies we meet that have already been, you know, reviewing, cross-analyzing the CPI data and are heavily dependent on that. And now there's an alternative source. And if we can get more contributors to sourcing new data inputs and rewarding them, by the way, um, for providing data sources as well as I think more and more people will, will, will consume it. And maybe even the people that use it can feed back into, um, you know, sourcing the data and, and, and give us additional insights in terms of uh, what we should be doing or how we can improve the code base and, and, and get to a even more accurately verifiable cryptographic truth. Hundred percent. I look forward to seeing the integrations and who winds up using Trueflation. Yeah, uh, Stefan, I, I know you had also mentioned the token and uh, the launch of a DAO. Could you kind of touch on what the token will be used for and how it will be distributed to the um, the holders? Yeah. So I mean, we got a, a, a token. We call it proof of contribution, um, and, and so that's sort of our token model. Um, where a data requester will pay in the uh, Oracle tokens. So ultimately, they'll pay in links, for example. That will then go um, to the Trueflation uh, Oracle, which then has a portion of that go directly to the data contributor. Um, and we will then have a certain proportion of that converted into true tokens, and that other proportion will be rewarded to the data provider or contributor in true tokens. Um, that's sort of the model uh, that we have. All of that process will be governed by a DAO. Uh, and the DAO's responsibility will obviously be what mount monitoring the treasury, the weighting in the Oracle itself, um, identify how we distribute the rewards to the participants, and then any dispute resolution, for example, that would also be covered by the DAO itself. 
That's awesome. Are you guys yeah. um, going to have like a council or anything like that as part of the DAO? Or is it just going to be like, hey, you hold X amount of tokens. This is how many uh, votes you have. Um, at the moment, we had just been thinking about the amount of tokens you have and the votes you have. We might have a council for the representation of DAO. Um, we have thought of that. But at, at, at the beginning, we haven't sort of got to implementation yet. And hence, we're talking to a number of data DAOs. So we've got a call with D Climate, which is a data DAO uh, also working very closely with Chainlink. Um, so Chainlink has facilitated that introduction. And so super excited to see what their model is and how what their learnings are. How do we take those learnings and incorporate that in into our DAO model as well? Yeah, that's that's pretty smart. I love that. Yeah. Um, I guess kind of uh, looking into 2022 as well, like what can members of the audience like look forward to seeing you guys launch uh, throughout the year? What should they be looking forward to? So we're we're gonna we've got a big marketing campaign coming out. So where we want to be working with Chainlink and doing hackathons, um, sort of, um, yeah. How can the community? We want to get a whitelist up where people can contribute, provide input into the sources of data. Um, how do we get discussion boards going? Uh, so we've already got a, a a Telegram group up and running. We've got a Reddit channel. Um, we've got a Twitter channel, but Twitter maybe not the best platform for more detailed conversations around proposals on improving, um, number one, the algorithm itself or the weighting, improving data sources or identifying new data sources. That's where we really want the community to come in. And then how do we provide and get enable people to access Truflation and use the feeds super easily and build on top of it. And we just want to grow on both fronts in year one, 2022, help us grow this, help us get adoption, help us get ideas. We'll, we'll work with you. We'll give you resources. We want to just really get this spread out, uh, both from the access standpoint, people using it, adopting it, even if the ideas are crazy, let's say we're experimenting and that's the beauty of where we are. We need to experiment and we want to work with you to help that experimentation and the community um, and developers, right? Um, developers, in my view, are the most creative sources um, uh, and what I call sort of feature foragers, right? We're foraging new features with products that are available there. And the product is a benchmark index. So please build a new feature and forage, you know, the Marines go, you know, you know yeah, forage with, with, with these features that you know, this index and build new features around that. I love that. Yeah. Guys, uh, they have a really active telegram of been in there. Like they're all brainstorming ideas. Don't, don't hesitate to, to jump in there if you want to help out the project. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're live. I mean, yeah, and, and we're just building out. We're we're going to be working alongside, hopefully, alongside Chainlink to get to some of the hackathons there. Um, you know, uh, get much more um, working with yeah, with 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 the Link Marines, hopefully, and then the developers that are using their tool sets to really build out a Dawn, right? Or I think it's called a, a data oracle network on Chainlink. How do we do that? Um, and looking for advice on what we need to improve, uh, how we optimize and get better going down this path. I mean, it's still an experimentation. And, and this year, we just want to really experiment and see how and where this could go, what gets traction, um, and, and, and what the community is asking for from the DAO. And ultimately... What can we do to support the DAO to get there faster? Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, yeah. I love I love how crypto is so community focused, and uh, I, I love the approach that you guys are taking to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I the beauty of that's that's to me the beauty of crypto, right? We have communities. We we have 
we've ad adjusted. So in the old world, you used to have shareholder meetings once a year where people would gather in a room and talk about, you know, AGMs, right? And everybody flocks in for these AGMs. They get a free sandwich and a free glass of water or coffee or something. And then they go in for their shareholder meetings, right? Why do I still need that today? And, and I don't need to go through 15 intermediaries to find out what my shareholder is saying. In fact, today, the shareholder has no representation anymore in, in what a company does other than possibly voting for the auditor, a distribution of dividends, and that's about it, right? And there, it's also your shareholders, nine times out of 10, is some, some big hedge fund. And they don't want to vote because there might be a conflict of interest and some possible liability. So they then identify a proxy to act on their behalf and vote at shareholder meetings on their behalf. So the shareholder has no relationship other than a financial to the actual business itself. And that business then has a conflicting interest because they, on the one hand, want to look for customers first or is it shareholder first, right? And so that's a big um, divergence that's happened in the legacy world. In crypto land, we're super digital. We have sentiments, you know, that we can read very quickly in our Telegram channels, on our Reddit posts, in your Twitter feeds, right? And so based on that, we can then very quickly identify, ooh, you know, people are talking, they want us to go down this path. Okay, let's let's do that then. Let's go down that path. And if they do that, there's an immediate reward for having gone down that path in the form of you know, thumbs up, maybe price go up, but that's less important. It's more in transactions. The utility value of the product we're building has gone up and the community is using that serve that utility service more. And ultimately, that results in a bigger contribution and a greater economic value um, to crypto land. 100%. I also think it gives, you know, projects and companies more resources to tap into since the community is more connected to the actual business. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Um, and and, um, and yeah, it's, it's more fun, too. <laughs> I mean, you, <laughs> yeah, you we're all about fun. You, yeah, I mean, you get direct interaction. You have, you know, you, you're chatting with the people. I mean, it can be... It can be brutal at times, but overall, it's 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 all the more rewarding. Yeah, that, that's really it's really great to hear. Um, kind of, I had a question around like the future um, of Trueflation. Do you do you envision this rolling out to like all all fiat currencies in the future? Uh, we, that's that's ultimately where we want to go to. I think we're starting off with the US dollar, we might go to the next biggest currencies, right? It could be, uh, it could be um, Euro, renminbi, maybe the Japanese yen, uh, and then going across the next set. Or we could go to, um, you know, maybe the smaller economies, right? One thing that somebody, Balaji mentioned, um, was that, you know, if you look at the countries around the world, what's the percentage of countries that have a population less of than 10 million people. And I think it's something like 60% of the world's nations, uh, or at least the states out there, the nation states have less, uh, as a population less than 10 million. And so if that's the case, is there a way to get bigger traction in some of these smaller nations and provide them with a better insight of what inflation is and I think we're still exploring that. But we started with the U.S. dollar first and we'll go to other currencies after for sure. The other thing that you ask yourself is, sorry, is, is, is not only on a state, you know, nationwide level, but how about if you bring it down to a to micro state? So we just look at inflation in Colorado, we just look at inflation in Miami itself or things like that. Is that another way to look at it, right? Um, and then at some point, you can look at it on a global level. You aggregate all of that. What's it globally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that Honestly, that would be super cool uh, and definitely something that you I could see you guys implementing in the future uh, with all the, once you get all the data streams set up and um, have have a have a strong foundation. 
Yeah. It's, 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 it's prioritized. I mean, yeah, in a way you don't have infinite resources and then ultimately you also need to aggregate the resources together, but the more decentralized we are and, and as we work through that decentralization, how do we, how do we allow for the resources that are contributing to the Truflation Oracle to then have that, you know, come out as a more specific or more targeted type of truflation for that market, that product, that bucket, that um, country or that nation or that network. One hundred percent. Stefan, uh, near the end of these episodes, we we always like to open it up to the audience and allow members to ask questions. Are you, are you down? Do you always, always. Hey, if, if anyone in the off- audience has a question for Stefan, just hit that request button. We'll let you guys on one at a time. Be super based. Don't be shy. Uh, well, while we're giving you the minute here, uh, Stefan, just really appreciate you taking the time out to come and speak to us. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed learning about Truflation and, I uh, just honestly love how passionate you are about the community that you guys are building. No, thank you for having me. Look, you know, um, you know, time is the one resource that we can't replenish or replace. And so really appreciate you giving me the time and everybody listening in and taking the time and an amazing community you've pulled together. I've listened to your historical podcasts on, on your website and it's like, yeah, really impressed in terms of all the work you've done to get some really, you know, yeah, good good speakers and good content. So, yeah, like what you're doing. And Thank you so much. That we appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. A lot. Thank you. Hey, Stefan, a uh, quick question for you. Uh, would it be possible to hey, do Mike. a similar decentralized inflation index for either a global uh level or yeah say like canada australia the european union yeah and that's that's ultimately where we want to go i think we've identified sort of the european union as a as a next case um but canada is definitely something we'd love to do as well um yeah super keen on 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 extrapolating this into other markets as well and that's that's part of 2022 for sure. Awesome, thank you. If we yeah. can take it glo- global as well, that'd be nice as well. <laughs> Seven, because the alter- yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say this kind of really sparked an idea, and it's really kind of going back to our conversation about technology being deflationary. What what does inflation look like in a world where you have mass adoption of crypto? Uh, that's because, and that's why sort of I, I'm super keen on building an in, a trueflation index for the various chains. So if you, so how can I then, you know, if you're on the Ethereum network or, you know, in Ethereum is going through deflation, what does that mean for your token on top of there. What does that mean for the yield? And by the way, Ethereum goes global, right? There's there's no there's no boundaries to Ethereum. It is a global currency and we all work in our head in ETH or links or etc. right? And so what is the inflation or deflation associated with any of those tokens and how does that impact the yield that you're earning in real terms? on that network, right? So I view that each of the chains are actually in crypto land, they are network states. And so is a network state, is a state, they have their own governance, they have their own inflation, they have their own economy, and that is reflected in in, in, in the price. And ultimately, as a result, they also have inflation. Um, you still pay your gas fees in ETH, right? You can't pay it in anything else. And so if you're paying it in ETH, ETH is an important category. And if gas fees go up, inflation is pretty high. So if you're using ETH 
as a business, you then need to pay in ETH. What does that look like? How do you bring, yeah, there's an inflation there. How do you track that? How do you offset that um, in your pricing, ultimately, if that's something you want to do? Yeah, that's uh, that's super fascinating. It really adds a, a, a whole nother dimension to this yeah. entire piece of the like puzzle that you're trying to solve for. <laughs> um, yeah, I think on, 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 we still... I remember the first time that I was shown a contract that was, yeah, I mean, even, even if you look at Chainlink, right, you pay in links. You don't, they don't think about dollars or anything. You just, the contract is in links, right? You pay in links, you pay in ETH. The first time I was put a contract, which was no, no reference to any fiat currency. It was just in native token and, and, I thought that was brilliant, right? Because in essence, you pay that much today in your mind, you're just doing the conversion into fiat and that's how much it is. Oh, super expensive, right? But, and then, but in essence, yeah, you still sign it and, or you, you negotiate a bit in that, but it's still in that native currency. They get paid in that. And if it's a, a year contract, in a year's time, it's going to be a lot more expensive than what you signed today. And, uh, and yeah. Ultimately, because crypto has been deflationary and prices have been going up significantly. One hundred percent. I don't think we have any more audience questions, uh, but this has been incredible, incredible, Stefan. Yeah, thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, um, look, you can find yeah, me on, on on Twitter s russ ninety nine. Um, or on Telegram, same, same, you are, same handle. Um, yeah, any questions? Also, we have Trueflation on Telegram. Please join, sign up, contribute. Um, it's pretty active. It's a very, uh, you know, there's way, two ways to grow a community. One is quality and quantity. And I'd say really super high quality in terms of conversation at the moment on the Trueflation Telegram chat. Um, and, and stay tuned. We'll be announcing a lot more. Very, and I think there's an announcement coming out tomorrow. Um, and we'll be sharing that up there as well. Amazing. I'll, yeah. I'll let everyone go, man. This has been super okay. based. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Stay strong for the rest guys. of your quarantine. Stay yeah, based. <laughs> stay. I will stay based. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Stay based, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks. See ya.